What's up you guys and welcome back to my channel to the very last video of 2019 which is absolutely crazy to say. I didn't even realize it till the past few minutes that this is the last time I'll be filming and uploading and posting for this year. So I quickly just wanted to say thank you to you guys for everything that we've managed to accomplish this year, the patience that you guys have had with me trying to learn new things to make this channel better for not just uh, you guys, but also for the sake of the cases that I'm covering. It's been a crazy year, so many opportunities, and honestly, I cannot wait to see what 2020 brings. Before I jump into today's video, I also have someone else to thank, and that is NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. Safety is a huge part of this channel, as you guys already know, and online safety is one thing that I feel can sometimes be overlooked, and I think we, I see this a lot in my personal life, and I also see this a lot in the different cases that I'm covering. If you're not aware of what a VPN is, it is a virtual private network that helps to protect your identity while you are online. Obviously, this is very important for what I do. I do a lot of online research. I have a lot of things happening when it comes to the internet. I have a YouTube channel. There's so many different things going on for me. So I need the best VPN I can absolutely get, which is where NordVPN comes in. NordVPN was actually selected as the best VPN and the best VPN awards for 2019. And that is absolutely no surprise for so many different reasons. First of all, they have over 5,500 servers and over 60 different countries, 24 seven customer support, and they have a 30 day money back guarantee guarantee. And on top of that, they just make it so incredibly easy to protect your identity, to protect your passwords, to protect credit card information, pretty much anything important about yourself that could end up taken by hackers. They make sure that you stay protected, whether you are at home, if you are traveling, just anytime you go out to use public Wi-Fi, even if you just run down the street to Starbucks or you know, you're on your phone on the go. Right now, NordVPN has an amazing holiday deal that I really wanted to share with you guys. I know a lot of people are starting to kind of reevaluate their life and what they're doing and maybe the different safety measures that they're taking into the next new year. And NordVPN is actually offering an 81% off deal right now and you'll get two extra gifts. You guys can get four months extra with a three-year plan and also the NordPass password manager, which is usually, I think, $199. All you guys have to do is go to www.nordvpn.com forward slash Danielle and use code Danielle. You guys, this is not something that I take lightly. Internet safety is so important. The things that hackers can do these days is absolutely insane. Just like I said last time when NordVPN sponsored a video, if you've ever had your identity stolen or people somehow managed to get your passwords to important accounts, it's not fun. It is a huge mess to clean up and usually you're the only person that has to do it. So definitely check this out and thank you again to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. Now on to today's video. Today is a continuation of last week's video. If you have not watched that, I highly suggest you go ahead and watch it now. This is kind of a weird two-part thing that I decided to try out. The one that I did last week was on Amanda Tusing and her unsolved murder from 2000. And now this is about the unsolved murder of Dana Steidem from 1989. And there is a huge possible connection here. You guys had a bunch of different theories last week. A lot of you strongly believe Believed it was someone like law enforcement that was involved in her disappearance and murder. But this one definitely kind of throws a little bit of a wrench in there because this unsolved murder does have a very possible suspect. And I'm very interested to see what you guys have to think about it. And if you do believe that these cases are potentially connected, unfortunately, I don't really know what authorities have to strongly believe this. I'm sure they're keeping a lot of that very tight to the vest. But just keep in mind while I'm telling you guys what happened to Dana and the possible different scenarios, that authorities clearly do have some reason to believe that these are connected. So now let's just go ahead and start off by talking about Dana. Dana was born on March 8th, 1971 in Gravette, Arkansas, where she grew up with her parents, Lawrence and Georgia. She was a very intelligent individual. She graduated among the top in her class from Gravette High School in 1989, the same year that unfortunately she was murdered. Her mom said, and I quote, she was the kind of daughter people wish they had and I was lucky enough to have her. She was always so friendly. She was always so social. She loved to babysit. She just loved helping people in any way that she possibly could. The summer after she graduated from high school, she immediately moved out of 
her parents' house. I believe that she stayed with her cousin for a short period of time. And then she eventually got an apartment with her brother, Larry, in Centerton, Arkansas. Her and her brother were very, very close. And she was kind of doing this while she was trying to figure out what her next step was going to be in life. She thought she wanted to study business at a local college, but in the meantime, she was just kind of working and figuring herself out. She had taken a job at Harp's Grocery Store, which I believe she actually worked there for about three years. It was Harp's Grocery Store then, but now it is Phillips Grocery Store, and the location was in Bella Vista, um, Arkansas. But on July 25th, 1989, something very odd and unexplainable happened that took every single potential opportunity away from her. Dana headed the 10 minutes that it took away from her apartment with her brother Larry to her parents' home to do her laundry. This was a typical thing that she did on Tuesdays. Her dad, Lawrence, was home at the time. He was not feeling well. I believe he had a bunch of different medical issues. So he was there when she arrived. She seemed in great moods. She did her laundry and he asked her if she didn't mind going to pick up some medicine for him because he didn't feel well enough to take himself. At around 3 p.m., Dana left her parents' home to head to a local store to grab some medicine. She stopped first for gas and then headed to a store which should have only been a couple of miles away. She should have been back fairly quickly, but at around 4 p.m. an hour later, her mother Georgia came home and Lawrence said that she had never shown back up. This was not at all like Dana. She was a very responsible individual. She knew her father was relying on this medicine. There was no way she would have taken that long to get back unless something had happened to her. Parents believe that the one thing that would stop her from getting home could potentially be that she had car trouble. So this is essentially playing out exactly like Amanda's case did. So they decided to drive around and try to find her. There was a small convenience store, I believe, that was closer to their home than Phillips Grocery Store, which was, I think, about four miles away. They checked there. She hadn't been there. They traveled all the different routes. She was nowhere along those roads. So they decided to stop into Phillips Grocery Store itself to see if maybe anyone there had seen her. And sure enough, everyone there said that she had been there just a little after three o'clock so she had at least made it to her destination but somehow the four miles back she seemed to have vanished Dana had apparently spoken to multiple different employees inside that she was friends with she spoke to another employee outside when she was on her way out to her car and even some of the people there landscaping said that they saw her get into her car and drive off but they just didn't remember the direction she had taken they decided to wait for a little bit just to see if maybe she showed up. They were trying to give her the benefit of the doubt. Again, she was very responsible. So they believed maybe there was just something they didn't understand or didn't know that she had to do real quick and she would eventually show back up. But hours passed and she never came back. Then finally at around 9.15 p.m. when Larry got home, her brother, he called his parents to say that she was not at the apartment either. None of her stuff made it back. She hadn't taken anything. So they called to report her as missing and by 9.15 9.43 p.m. a bolo was sent out, which is a be on the lookout for her vehicle. That entire night, her family and friends were out searching for her, but no one seemed to have any luck. It didn't make any sense. She had nowhere else to go. They didn't know what could have possibly happened to her. And then by 6.30 a.m. on the 26th, her car ended up being found by a police officer in the southbound lanes of Highway 71 near Wellington Road. Now, the officer at the time that passed by her vehicle had no idea that it was a missing person's car, and this officer eventually made it into work. I think she was uh, off at the time she passed by and then she realized she saw this car on the side of the highway so officers were sent back out there wasn't too much off about the car it was parked on the side of the highway which just in general is a little bit off uh, but other than that one of her rear tires was low the keys were still in the ignition just like Amanda's and her driver's side window was about halfway down almost as if she was talking to someone maybe um, she could have honestly just been riding with the windows open but I don't know if that was something very typical for her to do but the one strange thing they did notice is that the seat seemed to be adjusted to someone that was much, much taller than Dana was. So it almost seemed as if someone else had driven the car to this location. But other than that, there was no sign of a struggle and there was also no sign of Dana. None of her personal items were even still in the car. They were able to prove even further, however, that Dana had in fact at least made it to Phillip's grocery store. In the back of the car was a bag containing Alka-Seltzer, which was the medicine for her father, dish soap and sugar. And there was a Phillip's grocery receipt and it was marked 3.17 p.m. from the day before. Her parents in general thought it was weird 
appeared that she had gone to Philip's grocery store to begin with. There was, again, that closer convenience store that she should, that she could have gone to, um, and they figured she would have just ran there real quick and brought it back. Um, I think it's very possible she just wanted to go somewhere that she was comfortable and could say hey to a few people, but they believed she would have actually just gone to the convenience store. Everyone also thought it was very odd that her car was found here because when I mentioned before that her family and friends had been searching the entire night before, they'd actually gone past this exact area where her car was found that next morning. They said that they traveled up and down that stretch of highway multiple times just in case and they didn't see a single thing, so it seemed as if the car just kind of popped up overnight. After the car was found, authorities were determined to find any of the belongings that she had with her at the time near the car or maybe even see if there was a way that they could find that she had gone. Maybe she had, for some reason, gone on the side of the highway. Her tire, she thought, went flat. She went searching for help. So for weeks, authorities and Dana's family searched on foot and driving all over trying to find any sign of Dana. Her family in specific even went to multiple surrounding states, pinning up posters everywhere that they possibly could. Authorities brought in search dogs to try to attempt to locate Dana where she might have gone outside of the car and they were actually able to find some of her laundry about 1700 feet away from where her car itself was found. They also decided to send search teams out on horseback to try to navigate the terrain a little bit faster and a little bit better but they really weren't finding all that much at first sightings began to flood in within the first few weeks. It was just sighting after sighting. So many people believe that they had seen Dana alive and well going around, which was obviously a very hopeful, great thing, but also her parents did not believe she would have just ran away without saying a single thing. They didn't believe she would just go out to get her father medicine and then just disappear to do something different. Eventually they did, however, end up finding more items of Dana's, which just took kind of another blow to the investigation because it just wasn't leading them in a very positive direction. They ended up finding her purse at the intersection of Chaucer and Hanover Road and then her checkbook and then her license, and then a few other personal belongings. And then just a few miles north of where her car was found, they also found a couple of other items that were scattered on the side of the road. And this made it seem like the items had just been thrown out of the window while the car was in motion. They figured the best place to start when it came to questioning people for what may have happened to Dana was with her classmates. And all of her classmates ended up pointing to one particular person and his name is Michael. And he was another classmate of Dana's. Multiple people claimed that this Michael had been driving around at about 3 a.m. the night of Dana's disappearance. When they spoke to this classmate, uh, it was strange to say the least and this is just the first strange thing that this particular person did in the following years Literally up until now when they spoke to this classmate He said that he had a girlfriend that could give him an alibi for that night So obviously authorities wanted to check out that alibi So they went to this girlfriend who said she knew absolutely nothing about this and she could not give him an alibi So they then went back to Michael who apparently gave them another girlfriend to give him an alibi and when they went to this one, she apparently stuck with it for a little bit, but then eventually caved and said she had no idea what he was doing the night of Dana's disappearance. But other than that, other than knowing that he was possibly driving around at around 3 a.m., which is honestly not that untypical for teenagers to do, and the alibis falling through, they had no proof at all to connect him to anything in regards to Dana, so they just had to sit and wait. And then two months later, on September 17th, 1989, Dana's remains were found. A hunter found her remains buried in a very shallow grave in a dry creek bed only 100 feet away from Beale Lane. Her remains were badly, badly decomposed. Her clothes were found thrown around all around her. She had been stripped completely nude prior to her death or maybe after her death. The location was very, very remote. Nobody would have known about this location other than people like hunters. Um, you wouldn't just end up here. It was very, very specific. The remains were not full. I believe there were a few bones that appeared to be missing and they were all sent to a medical examiner where they were confirmed to belong to Dana through dental records. And the medical examiner tried try to figure out all they could with what they had. If you guys are unaware, which I'm sure most of you are at this point, once a body's fully decomposed, pretty much, there's not much you can find out. It's really hard to find out cause of death. I mean, you lose a whole lot. And that's the exact situation they were facing with Dana. 
And this is exactly what ended up happening. The medical examiner did say there appeared to be a nick in her shoulder blade that could have possibly been consistent with maybe a stab wound to the neck or something similar. But unfortunately, her sternum was missing. And that was absolutely crucial to finding out if that had been the cause of death. So because of that, a cause of death is unknown. When it comes to comparing this to Amanda's murder, they couldn't determine if she had been drowned or suffocated. So I at least find it interesting that there is potential potential here that a weapon itself was used because I find the idea of no trace behind of what happened to someone, I find that very, very unique. And if this is a serial killer that we're talking about, I feel like that would be something they would keep up. Now, keep in mind, however, that Dana was murdered 10 years before Amanda was murdered, technically 11. So maybe things changed between Dana's murder and Amanda's murder, but that's just something that you should keep in mind. But then something odd happened that ended up leading authorities again to the same person they had been looking into originally. Shortly after Dana's death, her temporary grave marker was stolen that following December of the exact same year. But when they looked deeper into it, they found out that it was actually the work of the same classmate that every single person had initially pointed their finger towards at the beginning of the investigation. Now, this is when more information about this man named Michael kind of shows up. So... He apparently really wanted to date Dana. I've, I've seen a couple of different versions of the story. I've seen some articles call him her boyfriend, which if that's not the case, is very, very disrespectful because the other story is that he wanted to be with her and she constantly rejected him. And the idea is basically that he got mad about that and possibly did something about it. They found Michael and they ended up charging him and he paid the fine, he admitted to taking the grave marker and he even had a reasoning behind it. So he claimed that he was not able to go to her funeral and it was really, really upsetting for him. He said that he was in the Navy and he was not able to make it. So when he got back for a little bit of time, he went to go and visit her grave and figured that the grave marker was eventually going to be thrown out anyway. So he decided to take it for himself to have at least something to remember her by. But this in itself even put his story into question. When authorities took this information and questioned other people about it, apparently Michael had been hounded by recruiters for a very, very long time to join any branch of the military. And he may tell them no and basically avoid them at all costs, but not after Dana disappeared. Right after Dana disappeared, out of nowhere, he took sudden interest in the Navy, signed up and disappeared. So a lot of people believe that this timing was quite the coincidence. But the more they looked into his story, the more it seemed to connect a little bit with even Dana's disappearance that day. Apparently his parents owned the closest convenience store, the one that Dana's parents thought she would go to, but she didn't and they kept wondering why. And according to a lot of people, that's because she avoided it. Michael tended to just hang out there. He would sit in the parking lot. He would just go hang out inside. And because I guess he kept coming on to her and she kept having to deny him, it got to the point where she just said, forget it and just stopped going there altogether. This really led authorities to think there was something more here. So they brought him in for more questioning and the questioning continued for years, you guys, like years and years and years. And a lot of people are still questioning that he was involved to this day. He failed quite a few polygraphs from what I have seen, and they even asked him for a DNA sample because at one point during his questioning, he said, and I quote, and you guys will not believe what's about to come out of my mouth, he said, sometimes I think I killed Dana, but I know I didn't. Now, I already know there's different styles of interrogation that can kind of trick someone into believing they did something wrong when they didn't, um, but that is quite something to just state in general, and I have no evidence to back that he had a specific technique used on him, like the read technique, for instance. Um, but when they heard that, that was enough for them to ask for his DNA. They also wanted to actually see what he was really doing that night, because at this point, they had these two failed alibis that he tried to force down their throat from the beginning, but they still didn't know what actually happened. And eventually, he cracked. And he finally said what all of his classmates mates had said that that night that Dana disappeared and eventually was murdered, he was just simply driving around in his father's truck. And I don't know if it got any more detailed than that, but I personally have seen no more details at all. 
Authorities decided to find this truck because they honestly believe Dana could have ended up in someone else's vehicle or some of her belongings may have ended up in someone else's vehicle. And it turned out that shortly after Dana's disappearance and murder, the truck was sold as well. But they were able to locate it. And when they did, they ended up finding quite a few things. They ended up finding a hair in the car or a few hairs at least. And when they tested them, they came back as possibly being Dana's. Unfortunately, the follicle was not on the end of the hair, which contains the full DNA. So they weren't able to say it was a 100% match, but that's still pretty dang close to make it even more suspicious given all of the information that they already had. They also found a couple of spots of blood, but I have absolutely no idea if they ever got any results results back on that. I only saw it mentioned a few times. I think since it wasn't mentioned, there's a high probability that it may have come back as Dana's uh, and they just need to keep that information to themselves. But they just didn't have enough. They even really upset the public at one point by coming forward and saying that they were about to move forward with an arrest, which was basically the arrest of Michael, but they couldn't actually do it at all because they just didn't think it was going to go through and they only had circumstantial evidence. But still, after this, Michael continued to act a little bit strange. Apparently his girlfriend at the time said that he would leave his house in the middle of the night and go cry at Dana's grave. And his current wife is not the picture he has in his wallet. It's a picture of Dana. Now, a lot of people kind of argue about this because we all grieve in very different ways. And even if he hadn't dated her and he just had a huge crush on her, maybe he created this emotional attachment to her, this deep emotional attachment, whether she reciprocated that or not. And this is his way of grieving and dealing with it. But a lot of people believe he's doing this because he feels guilty or had an obsession that was sent way over the edge. That's all that they had. And it was so frustrating because she was only four miles away from her home. She drove four miles away to go to the grocery store where she was around tons of people that she knew and knew her. And all she had to do was get in her car and drive like a minute back, if that. And somehow in that short time frame. It, she vanished. They even decided to put the officer that had originally found her vehicle under hypnosis to see if there was anything she was forgetting because she did drive past it off duty and then later on realized that this was the vehicle of a missing person. And apparently under hypnosis, the officer claims to have seen a three-tone Chevy Ranchero truck behind Dana's car when she first originally passed it. She remembers seeing that the back tire was low and she remembers a man being right beside the tire outside of his truck by Dana's car with a bag of tools, almost as if he was going to fix it. The officer said the truck had a green top, it had a wood grain inset, and then the lower portion of the car was white. But a lot of people struggle to really believe a lot of that because this is something that happened under hypnosis. Um, and this wasn't something that the officer remembered otherwise. And then in 2013, the one case happened, the one shooting happened that somehow managed to link to Dana's case and then link to Amanda's case. A 62 year old man named Orville Mitchell Goodwin from Pineville, Arkansas ended up being sentenced to 12 years in prison plus an additional 10 years suspended for shooting a woman named Annette. This is the woman that I spoke about in last week's video. I'm not gonna speak too much on Annette. She did survive the shooting and I don't want to full on throw all of her information out there. Uh, but basically long story short, her husband passed away in 2012 and she started to spend a lot of time with 62 year old Goodwin. Night of the shooting, Annette was with Goodwin and she had just cashed a check for her husband's estate. And likely because of this money, Goodwin then drove Annette to Bella Vista Creek bed um, and shot her in the face and just left her there. Now, I don't know if he's ever admitted that he was trying to murder her. I'm assuming that anyone that's going to shoot someone in the face has intentions of killing them, but she survived it. And she ended up crawling a couple hundred feet away west where she eventually collapsed on the ground. And then the next day she was found by a group of horseback riders. They remember walking up and seeing her on her hands and knees, again, attempting to crawl towards help with her face just bleeding. Got 
down, tried to help her, and called authorities. She was taken to Springfield, Missouri to a hospital where she was treated for her injuries, and authorities came to speak to her to figure out what on earth had happened. Now, the whole entire first week, she was very, very reluctant to speak about what happened. She basically would keep her head down, wouldn't answer many questions, and eventually she said that she thought maybe her neighbors had been the one who shot her, but that didn't make a lot of sense because she wasn't near her neighbors exactly at the time. But then finally she opened up and confessed that Goodwin had been the one to shoot her, so they were able to get a search warrant that they executed at Goodwin's house. Now, when they executed the search warrant they found blood on Goodwin still they found blood in his vehicle they also found a whole arsenal of weapons on him they took all of this evidence and sent it off to the lab where they found that it was in fact a complete match to Annette so they were able to solve obviously who shot her and charge him for it authorities have kept pretty tight to the vest why they believe there is some sort of connection between what happened to Annette and Goodwin that's responsible and then Dana's murder and then possibly Amanda's murder. There are right off the bat maybe only a handful of things that are very similar but one thing that's very different is that we know exactly what happened to Annette because she survived it. There is no telling if this is exactly what happened to Dana and Amanda. Maybe he lured them into his car, said he would help them or said he needed something and then he drove them off to a specific location and then killed them. One connection that I do possibly also see is that Amanda was thrown into, well, potentially thrown into a water-filled ditch. And Dana was found in a dry creek bed and Annette was taken to a creek about 12 minutes away from where Dana was found and she was shot there. Um, so it all seems to kind of be around potentially bodies of water. But another few issues, again, that I'm having is just the change up in methods potentially used. Um, just because though that there was no evidence on Dana that there was, you know, maybe a gunshot wound or anything like that, we also just don't know. There's just not enough information there to figure it out. The Nick could have been from a stab wound or it could have been something that animals may have done to her. But with Amanda, we know that there was pretty much absolutely no sign at all of trauma to her body. So could that be completely unrelated from these two cases? Maybe. Another thing that bothers me is that they're spread so far apart. Typically, you don't see that large of a time frame or a gap between one killing and another when it comes to serial killers. However, if you look at it from kind of a different viewpoint, it's almost like every 10 years or so. So there's Dana in 1989, and then in 2000, there's Amanda, and then in 2013, there is Annette. So I have absolutely no idea, and it also seemed like an actual relationship was formed with Annette. So could it be related? Possibly. Am I absolutely sold on that? Not exactly. But again, we don't have what authorities have. And if authorities have enough to say they believe there's a connection, then I think we could completely be missing something. As of 2018, authorities have said that it's still a very active investigation to find out what happened to Dana and who murdered her. And they've also actually stated there are several persons of interest. So this is very, very different in my opinion from Amanda's murder. They clearly have multiple things that are leading them to quite a few people. Obviously, we know there is a classmate from high school that could have potentially had a huge crush on her and was angry that he was denied. And then there's also Goodwin that could potentially be connected, but there could also be other people that we simply don't know about. I really hope this case gets solved soon. There's so much new technology with genealogy and DNA testing and things like that. And I feel like they might have some sort of DNA or something at least that could be sent out to maybe give them more answers not just because everyone deserves justice and her family deserves to know but I found out the most heartbreaking information towards the end of my research Dana's mother has survived everyone at this point she lost her daughter in 1989 her husband passed away in 99 um, and then her son Dana's brother Larry that she was so close with passed away in 2015 so Every single person in the family, she's, oh my gosh, she's dealt with just so much loss and I cannot fathom what that must feel like. And then 
to lose one of those people and not have any idea what happened. I just really hope that authorities are able to do everything they can in order to get Dana's mother answers and to get Dana justice. I know that the community probably also feels very on edge because there is a potential serial killer out there. Authorities have stated that is a possibility, but the way that authorities still speak about it, I have all the faith in the world. They have even stated, you know, obviously it doesn't get as much attention as it probably deserves just because there are more current cases that they are working on, but they have in no way, shape or form forgotten about it and they are pretty determined to figure this all out and give everyone some answers but this is where I ask you guys what do you think is happening here do you think this is a situation where two three individuals had something happen to them that's completely unrelated to one another or do you believe there is possibly a serial killer out there or at least the same person could be responsible for all three. Honestly, a lot of you guys I saw in my last video are from Arkansas and you've stated that a lot of people have been a little on edge thinking there could be this highway killer out there. Um, and I've seen, you know, blog after blog online about it, about people believing this is something that's real and that people need to watch out for. But that's all I have for you guys today. And I cannot wait to see what you guys think about this. You guys always come up with the absolute best theories and always see connections that I don't see and that I've not seen anyone on any blog or anything comment on online or come up with. So I'm interested to see what you guys have to say. So leave a comment down below with what you believe is happening here. Make sure to share this information everywhere you still can because this is still a case that needs to be solved and authorities still need to get that exposure out there. And so does Dana's mom to make sure she gets some sort of closure. I wanna thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Dana's story. And if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button down below so we can hopefully bring them home together. And I will see you guys in my next video, which will be in 2020. And if you haven't already hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Howland fam, and I will see you guys in my next video in the new year. Bye guys.